Good morning, everyone. My name is Lujain Ismail, and it's with immense pleasure that I welcome you on behalf of Charger Art Foundation to the 16th edition of March meeting and to the third and final day of our program. This year, the March meeting theme to Washujat embodies the spirit of intertwining collaboration and the convergence of diverse thoughts and ideas. It reflects our commitment to collectively envisioning more inclusive, equitable, sustainable, and livable futures. March meeting 2024 Tawashujat explores collaborative methods that reappraise artistic, curatorial, activist approaches to reconfigure the role of art and artists in our current times. It also looks at the merit forms of coming together, such as learning platforms, activist movements, and publishing, which can serve as toolkits for social justice, solidarity, and political mobilization. Thank you for joining us here today. We're honored to host esteemed guest speakers, many of whom have journeyed from distant corners of the globe to join us. I'd like to start with a little housekeeping before we begin today's program. Please note that all sessions are in either English or Arabic, and simultaneous translation is available throughout the event. The translation headsets can be collected at the door uh, of the auditorium. Tea, coffee, and lunch will be provided throughout the day. Our first session for today is a panel titled Identity, Memory, and Materiality, and it's a it's a pleasure to welcome Ayan uh, Almi and Fazia Ismail, the Khan Collective, Solidad Munoz and Matea Asamino, Woven Memory, Maria Jose Murillo, Nocantus, and Yasmin Mjalli, Nol Collective. This session will be moderated by Hadia Nader Badri, Senior Adult Learning Coordinator at Sharjah Art Foundation. Please join me in welcoming them. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for being here so early. I was, um, I'll introduce myself first. My name is Hadiya Bedri, and I'm part of the learning and research team here at Sarja Art Foundation. I'll be moderating the panel. I will do my best to say as little as possible to give a chance to my wonderful panelists. Um, I was looking for an adequate way to start this panel, I tried to write the introduction many times, but nothing was adequate. I wanted to read the news um, to start, but I felt like that's not a good idea. And there was something very sinister about me being able to put my phone down and continue my day. But I will start with a quote from James Baldwin to start. The role of the artist is exactly the same as the role of the lover. If I love you, I have to make you conscious of the things you do not see. All artists, if they are to survive, are forced at last to tell the whole story, to vomit the anguish up. Hello, is it working? Okay, hi, thank you, that was beautiful. I love that. Um, hi, good morning everyone. I hope you're ready for this wonderful panel. I'm, I'm still quite tired actually, but I am really excited to be here and um, to represent Dagan Collective. Um, my name is Fawzia Ismail. I'm Ayan Elmi. And we're so, um, thank you to Sharjah Art Foundation um, for hosting us today. It's been such a um, life affirming and wonderful uh, space and environment to be in. So um, Dagan Collective, oh, I think there's a, I have to do something, don't I? Yeah, <laughs> On this, the clicker, sorry. This is where it all goes wrong. <laughs> um, where's the clicker? Does it work? Oh, there we are. Um, hi, so we are Dakan Collective. This lovely image here uh, was done by a uh, uh, graphic artist, Maya Mahindu, um, and represents our project that we did maybe four years ago now 
call Camel Meat and Tapes. Um, so, what is Dagan? What does Dagan mean? So, Somali Dagan cultural philosophies, this is a quote from Dr. Ilmi. Somali Dagan cultural philosophies are indigenous African philosophies that encapsulate multiple bodies of living comprehensive knowledge. These philosophies are the founding pillars of Somali societies in as much as they are overarching principles governing Somali peoples. In their cosmological sense, Dagan philosophies are the common threads that connect Somali peoples to their ancestral homelands in Somalia and to a communal way of life. Um, and so for us, really, we formed uh, a Dakar Collective um, as a way of coming together um, and creating a bit of space and community for Somali arts um, in the UK, just because we felt that there was an absolute absence of um, Somali art being represented within the cultural environment. So, oh, it works, wonderful. Um, this is our journey. So we started off with Camel Meat and Tapes 1 and 2. Um, Ayan's going to talk about that project and Audible Tapestries and House of Weaving Songs. But what I thought I would start with is to underpin kind of our methodology, really, about how we work. Um, so we've, we've, we've basically been working for about four or five years now, and we've kind of established a, a kind of foundational methodology in which we approach uh, the work. So for us, um, it's about everyday acts of storytelling. We, f we focus on everyday materials and practices that form the foundations of Somali culture, particularly nomadic culture. These include culinary traditions, collective weaving, music, and oral traditions, as well as methods of communication ex and exchange that have de developed as a consequence of physical separation. Each project begins by identifying a particular practice or material before examining how it relates to our present. So one element of our methodology is making a storytelling. So Somali culture has roots in nomadism and refuses to place emphasis on written stories or material objects. Instead, stories are told through a collective lens and center creative actions such as weaving textiles or preparing food. Mate making together allows stories to be told and untold, made and remade, and ultimately inherited. In the images above, you can see intergenerational Somali families gathered for a weaving workshop we held in Stockholm, Sweden, which was a part of the program for Monica Schrau's retrospective exhibition. We had grandmothers, mothers, and daughters gathered to learn anew, reconnect, and teach one another. It was really interesting as well, because um, uh, in Stockholm, the curriculum, they've actually got craft culture, so it was the first time that we had a you know, five-year-old, six-year-olds who were just completely enthusiastic about doing weaving, because they'd been crocheting bags and um, scarves, um, yeah, we absolutely loved that. So our first project, Camel Meat and Cassette Tapes, was the beginning of our storytelling journey. Um, Camel Meat and Cassette Tapes was an intergenerational exploration of what it means to be a Somali woman in Bristol. Over the course of six months, we worked alongside members of some Bristol Somali communities and researched a rich oral history that transcended borders via cassette tapes. In the 80s and 90s, Somali families communicated through cassette tapes. To communicate, bear with me, Somali families communicated through cassette tapes posted between family and friends. These tapes became a valuable vessel for the diaspora. To, mu to communicate with families, they were forced to leave behind, sharing stories ranging from the very mundane to sharing information on their journeys, particularly their live locations to declarations of love, to, in, to the intimacies of private life. The sessions with the elders were recorded using cassette tapes. 
which were then made into a soundscape that transported an audience into the musicality and the storytelling of Somali women. In this graphic image, you can see that it was um, made by a really lovely graphic designer called Stacey Alika. Um, you can see the elders who participated in our workshops and shared their voices on the Camel Meeting Cassette Tape soundtrack. Uh, this is images of the gathering that we had at Arnold Feeney, um, where we presented the work. Just before this, we had the elders gathering, and they joined us um, as they heard themselves. Um, and this kind of meant a lot to us because actually their criticism and feedback was integral to our work. So another element of our methodology is building with fragments and fractures. So the images that you see are from Somalia or taken in Somalia as part of the Wright collection from the British Commonwealth and Commonwealth archive taken between 1926 and 1940. Wright was a colonial officer in East Africa. So through displacement and trauma, many Somali traditions have been lost. We are engaged in a process of cultural recovery while acknowledging the many gaps that still exist. We embrace these fractures rather than trying to faithfully recreate a lost Somali culture. We instead focus on the acts of mistranslation on how past and present, personal and collective may be collaged together to create outcomes that resonate today. As part of both projects, Camel Meat and Cassette Tapes 1 and 2, we spent a significant amount of time in the British Empire and Commonwealth archives, where we looked at images like the ones above and objects relating to Somalia or its closest neighbors. During our visits, we came to a realization that the objects in the archive and the archive system itself captured the we came to the realization that the objects in the archive itself struggled to capture the embodied knowledge of our elders. And that in order to use archival material from these sites, we needed to either offer some context or weave it in with the insight of our elders. The elders' reaction to the archive was to request items to be returned or to offer insight into the value or purpose of the items. And to the end, like towards the end of the workshops at the archive, um, they kind of sang, well, they sang the Somali independence song, which was a song that was um, an independence from the British. It was kind of a powerful and moving moment for us, a kind of rejection of authority. Um, yeah, that working with the elders within that context was amazing um, because they were literally trying in Somali in front of the archivist going, steal that, steal that back, put it in your pocket take it in your bag so it was like they were constantly like these telling us to basically take take the stuff back which was really hilarious and and we were trying to explain to the archivists you know I know they, they, they love it here <laughs> they really do <laughs> um, okay so we're moving on to camel meat and tapes part two so uh, here you've got this kind of we did this experimental project with cassette tape material where we, which was done with Somali young people. So it was kind of a call and response. So the first project was working with elders and their memories of cassette tapes. And the second project, we really wanted young people to um, engage with this kind of really important time in Somali um, culture where the diaspora were moving across the world because of the war. Um, so we worked with Somali young people to explore their relationship with, with cassettes. They, none of them knew what a cassette was, had never used it before, and didn't realize how important it was to their parents. And what was wonderful about this project was they, we gave them um, cassette recorders and cassette tapes that they went and took home. And what, it, something interesting happened um, where for the young people, it was the first time parents and it really animated a side of their parents and grandparents stories that they didn't know once their parents or grandparents were being recorded by cassette tape they learned about you know they they didn't even know why that you know they knew a civil war happened but they didn't really know what happened they didn't know how their parents moved or the struggle of that journey and um, for a lot of them they were like wow we had no idea um, 
about this, this moment in Somali history for their uh, parents. And something came out around the kind of sonic, uh, this, this concept of sonic ashes, like you have loved ones voices still contained within tapes, um, but they may have passed on, you know, so they, you know, they've died either through the war or haven't survived. And so parents were talking about why these cassette tapes were so important and this kind of, uh, the, the kind of comfort they gain from being able to still hear someone's voice even if they have passed on. Uh, so it was kind of a really moving moment, but we really wanted the young people to um, also play around with this material. So we got them to um, cut up the tape and rework it and scrunch it up and then turn it into a soundscape. And that uh, project we did with um, a sound artist called uh, Rowan Bishop, and it was wonderful. They kind of made these fun experimental tape loops. Um, and really, this was we were exploring this concept of kibneen uh, through this, uh, this the, the word kibneen means to bring and mend two broken parts to make it whole again. So how do you how do you kind of build with these fractures um, through cassette tapes? So that was a really lovely project, and we also worked with Ibrahim Hersey, who's a wonderful archivist, Somali archivist, um, to explore the ways in which we can remember. How how do we remember? Uh, when the archives don't contain some of these um, intimate stories and journeys. Um, this is a film still. So we, we filmed, we, so the British Commonwealth Archive is really odd, right? It's in these, um, so these are objects that say you might see in the British Museum in London, but where they store like their objects, these major objects, it's not necessarily stored in, in London, it's stored in across these two massive warehouses in Bristol. So you have these warehouses where, what, what was his name? Uh, there's like a Sierra Leonean guard, um, I can't, Lloyd, I love him. It's like this p poor man sitting in, the, in this building, like, and it's really cold, and you, you know, you, it's kind of funny, you don't, you, you, you have to get permission to get access to this bizarre archive, but they contain everything, like the, the objects, you know, Britain was a huge empire and you've got this object collection in Bristol. And so we did get permission to film in there, which was wonderful. And yeah, they're old tobacco warehouses. And so we filmed in there, and these are some stills of Ian opening up these um, green boxes that contain uh, material. So we, we, it was really lovely to kind of have the opportunity to uh, film in there and then what we did is we transposed the kind of tape loops and the um, that the, the young people had made on top of the film contained with the archive so it was our it was almost like the young people talking back to this the Somali records that are contained in this really odd uh, warehouse uh, so this was an act about moving, I think for us, moving beyond this cycle of rootlessness. Like, so a lot of people who fled Somalia regularly found themselves trapped in situations of precarious survival with little opportunity to pass knowledge, practices, and traditions on. This kind of led to this sense of, um, just the sense of rootlessness. Uh, and we feel that we have to reclaim Somali culture to help create roots and a sense of identity and shared experience and belonging. So in order to do this, we really imagine our spaces as, uh, our projects as spaces of reprieve. So this is just before the event, um, and I love this image. It's got the cassette tape in the middle, but um, this kind of represents for us, like, the way in which we hold space um, and make room for the personal. We think it's really important to, in, in our art process, to make space um, for our community, but also to not feel pressure, because there can be pressure from underrepresented communities or marginalized people to act as ambassadors, bearing the responsibility of telling a collective story. So we're not, in, you know, we, we don't want to tell a collective story. Um, 
the pressure can limit the possibility of exploring the small and personal and often idiosyncratic experiences that make us who we are as individuals. Um, so we believe that we should all have the right to tell our stories in our own way. Um, but so we just, we focus on the material as a way of engaging and allow, giving space to um, the communities we work with to tell their stories in their own way. Um, so this is just an image from, uh, it's, we, it's just really nice. We host lovely things. Basically, hosting is an important part of our art practice. I don't know why, it's just, the atmosphere is always really lovely. People always come, everyone sort of, because you've, you're engaging communities that normally are like, oh, we, we don't engage in that. And normally the galleries are like, we never get this community in. And then like for the Arnolfini, they're like, wow, we never had so many black people in the space. <laughs> it was like, yeah, you haven't. Normally we always have food and Somali tea as well, which is lovely. Um, and trying to get galleries to understand, no, we, you need to feed and give people tea. <laughs> Eat proper. Um, so... Yeah, so we believe um, part of this is really about, a lot of the work we do is about resisting kind of tired narratives about Somalia. So if you, if you live in the UK or anywhere actually, it's just, it feels like what people know or understand about Somali communities is very singular. Um, it's about piracy, violence, famine, um, conflict. And we're like, there's so, there, are, there are so many deeper, complex, wonderful, human stories um, to tell. And I, I think we learn a lot from our elders. So the Somali women elders that we work with are hilarious. They're funny, um, they're survivors, um, they're very rude. <laughs> they're very, you know, why do you speak like a cockroach? Is one line I will always remember <laughs> about my Somali. You, you sound like a cockroach when you speak in Somali. It's really, um, yeah, we love them. There you go. <laughs> we love them. Um, so, yeah, so we, we're all about resisting the tired narratives while connecting with ancestral roots. So the image above is of, uh, there's me and Fozia weaving, but the initial image is of Fozia and one of our elders, Fadumo, who actually came to one of our initial workshops and she brought this piece of tapestry um, which she kind of had embedded a song into. So she read it like a sheet of music, um, the different patterns becoming words and sentences. It was like a really magical moment for us. It was really beautiful. And it was kind of what inspired us to learn to weave. So our project, uh, Audible Tapestries, allowed us to research Somali nomadic weaving techniques and the tactile technologies that can be incorporated into the woven object. We learned to weave Somali nomadic tap tapestries typically used as rugs or insulation for nomadic homes from a master weaver based in Melbourne, Australia by the name of Mahaba Suleiman. We did this all over Zoom because it was during the pandemic um, and she had a lot of patience. Uh, the craft and art of weaving have been very, has been largely unacknowledged because it's considered a woman's role. This fact is supported by the lack of research and documentation of Somali nomadic weaving. In our search, we found one paper written by Adnan and Fullerton, which highlighted the lack too. In this pa paper, they stated, in this semi-desert, the Somali people have developed a portable house called an Aral, which is in complete harmony with its environment. The land may look barren and hostile, but it contains all the necessary material for the aql and its contents. It is a brilliant illustration of the economic use of limited resources, an invention forced by the conditions of life and totally Somali in character. And yet the ingenious skill that produces these crafts has been rather neglected by foreign scholars and taken for granted at home." End quote. Despite weaving being at the heart of Somali nomadic life and culture, it has been devalued and mostly marginalized in the recording of Somali history. The practice is not seen as art-based, but rather a functional and necessary part of life. Women's work is expected to be done. Due to the lack of workshops and classes, we ended up hosting 
uh, and teaching some ourselves. So we've been going into schools across Bristol and teaching young Somali people, as well as going into communities um, where elders have their morning breakfast meetups. Um, and a lot of them actually, they, some of them have memories of their grandmothers weaving, and um, which has actually been magical seeing some people who've kind of just started weaving, didn't need our instruction, didn't need any kind of information, and were just weaving from the memory of their grandma weaving, which is something, I don't know, that's moved us. So our work seeks to capture moments. It is not durational and it rarely lingers. We capture the speed of conversation, the rhythm of song and speech. The moments with our elders are spent sitting with them to hear the, their stories. Conversations are like fireworks. If one, one person's memory is triggered, you know that there others will come. There is a magic sh in shared memory. When memory is shared, pieced together, there is an aliveness to it. It is not dead on paper. These memories are the stories of their lives, the stories passed on to them, which in, in turn become our stories to be passed on, living in us to be shared on. I love that. We, um, we are really inspired by Bell Hooks. I love her work. We, lo we love her work um, in, in terms of how she really talks about how you create communities of resistance and and I think part of our practice is, is doing that through weaving workshops and through engaging with that process of cultural recovery. Um, but in this, in this um, she says, if we fall prey to the contemporary ahistorical mood, we will forget that we have not stayed in one place, that we that we have journeyed away from home, away from our roots, that we have lived dry long so and learnt to make a new history. We have not gone the distance, but we can never turn back. We need to sing again the old songs, those spirituals that renewed spirits and made the journey sweet. Um, so in that vein, um, we really want to end with, um, yeah, and here again, the, I forgot about the testimony uh, urging us to keep the faith and go forward in love. And with that spirit in mind, um, we want to end with um, a film about House of Weaving songs. So all of this stuff is interconnected. Cassette tapes, music, the cassette loops to audible weaving, uh, is connected to the final, it's kind of led to this um, installation called House of Weaving Songs. Um, I don't know how we start it, actually. Thank you. The House of Weaving Songs is a wonderful, interactive, musical journey. So we've resituated in Aga, which is a Somali nomadic home built by women. And we have incorporated these beautiful audible tapestries. And when you go into the house, the idea is that it kind of the house of weaving songs envelops you. Climate change has been the big thing that has driven this piece, but particularly because people are being displaced. We're starting to think about what happens when that starts to occur, when people aren't able to think about the preservation of culture because they're too busy thinking about surviving. This project isn't about us being the kind of the sole preservers of culture, but rather how do we open up a dialogue about this issue? How do we platform the cultures that are going to be lost um, and celebrate them? You know, once you've interacted with these songs and stories about Somali nomadic weaving practices, you end up having your chance to contribute to the House of Weaving Songs. So it's almost like this is a living house, this is an embodied house. It's a wonderful kind of reflection of a kind of communal effort between everyone in the team and I and I's vision for, you know, how do we have these climate conversations? How do we have these difficult conversations? while still um, having hope and joy. 
the thing that we wanted was to people feel to feel like they're not alone. So having the voices of some of our elders, having the voices of others that have been through the apple previously, it's layering those sounds and voices so that you didn't feel like you were alone, but you could kind of express yourself however you wanted. And with the audio, really, we feel like no translation is needed because actually the music, the kind of the rhythms of the conversations, the way that Somali people speak, it's, it doesn't need to be translated. There's a lot of laughing that happens despite the, you know, despite the depressing topic. Actually, I feel like Somali people have had to deal with so many difficult things that I feel like laughing and humour is such a part of the culture and joy is such a part of the culture. And so we wanted to make space for that and have a different kind of conversation about climate in Bristol. Hello. Hello. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Soledad Munoz. Uh, okay. Matthew. <laughs> Hi, my name is Matthew. Yeah, Matthew Samenu. We are from Woven Memory. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank everyone at the Sharha Art Foundation. Thank you so much for inviting us. It's been amazing. I also wanted to thank everyone in the panel. <laughs> I love you all. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I also wanted to take a moment to thank everyone that has made this possible. Um, the AV people, uh, Aisha, uh, the people who give us coffee, the people who keep our, our, our spaces tidy, the drivers, um, I think, yeah? Yeah, all of them, because without them, then nothing works, and all this invisible labor sustains the world, you know? And so, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Bye. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, yeah. Woven Memory is a series of site-specific installations commemorating the lives of the disappeared detainees and political executees of the civic military dictatorship in Chile which started after the US-backed coup on the democratically elected president Salvador Allende on September 11th of 1973. Although the dictatorship lasted until 1991, the Chicago Boys neoliberal doctrine installed by the dictatorship continues affecting the lives of Chileans every day. I'll give a bit of background to my practice through a previous piece entitled La parte de atrás de la arpillera, the back of the arpillera, which is made in collaboration with Chilean artists Amarante Espinosa and Lula Almeida, right before woven memory. In this audiovisual work, we sought to show the alternative history of Chile through the work of the arpilleristas and their influence in the textile collectives that emerged after the feminist revolution of 2018 and the revolt La revuelta, eh? <laughs> of 2019. Uh, I, this is an arpillera. Um, arpilleras are textiles of narrative imagery made by the family members of the disappeared and the political prisoners during this dictatorship. These embroideries denounced and created international awareness of the atrocities perpetrated by the regime by sending these works out to North America and Europe via human rights organizations, which enabled the arpilleristas to sustain their families at the same time of forging international awareness about their relatives tortured or disappeared. In, I knew my world vision and therefore my art practice was based on my lived experience as a Chilean born in exile because several of my family members had been political prisoners during the dictatorship. But until I was able to listen first-hand accounts of my ancestors, I realized that although I don't make arpilleras, my work 
holds on to the same principles. The textile as an archive, relato textil, textile narration. The text in the textile of the arpilleras, uh, the arpilleras are able to illustrate the most robust concepts and feelings with just three elements. And they're in the book, yeah. Um, uh, with just three elements, a doll, a phrase, and an object or a background, as seen in this arpillera book given to me by my friend and mentor, Belgica Castro, who was a member of the first arpillera workshop in Chile. That being said, we are all constantly reading each other textiles, and we can tell so much about a person through them. And then the third is the historical materiality within textiles. In the arpilleras, these characteristics are out of necessity. Uh, during the dictatorship is evidenced, uh, is out of necessity. The, the scarcity during the dictatorship is evidenced in their use of burlap that they could find in flour sacks. And the arpillera itself was made out of tablecloths, curtains, and in many cases, the clothing of their disappeared loved ones. In my work, I use copper as a tangible connector between the installation of the dictatorship and therefore neoliberalism, and the reason why today all of our natural resources are privatized and our land has been deemed a sacrifice zone to sustain our colonizers. More than fighting for an ideology like anti-communism wants to frame it, my ancestors killed during the dictatorship were fighting for our land and self-determination. And the last one, the political possibilities of textiles. What does, can the object do in society? The arpilleras, like me and many other in this room, do not have the privilege of not being political. Since their inception, they were made as a tool for social change and denunciation. Like the arpilleristas, woven memory is not about the object, which can be consumed and appropriated and collected by our oppressors. With the team, we always ask ourselves, what can the object do? That doing is what we understand as art. Uh, Woven Memory is a project created around my large-scale copper wire weavings and sound installations. Since 2021, the team has been working in collaborations with communities in Chile to create instances that instigate critical ar awareness around the human rights violations perpetrated by the Chilean civic military dictatorship. We use, I use collaborating as a very loose term. People in our team um, actually work in the sites of memory that we put the pieces in. And then Hector is an ex-political prisoner. My brother and I, we have, a, um, I guess, embodied trauma. And then my husband, my best friend. And so it's really like a collaboration, but it's just healing, I don't know. It's, it's not very structured as a collaboration. Okay. Um, so the sites. Oh, no, it's not a big piece. Yeah. In 2004, the, National Commission, the Chilean National Commission of Political Prisoners and Torture recognized 1,132 sites used by state agents and civilians to perpetrate human rights violations during the dictatorship. These sites include, but are not limited to, mass graves, clandestine torture and extermination centers, police and military bases, prisons, stadiums, and concentration camps. Currently, the communities related to these sites and various social organizations are recovering and repurposing these infrastructures as sites of memory, which are recognized and protected by the Council of National Monuments. 
Woven Memory takes place in these sites and has been hosted by the communities of La Deleidosa and Tocopilla, the former detention center Sitio La Memoria La Providencia, Sitio de Memoria La Providencia en Antofagasta, the clandestine torture and extermination center Londres 38, and the Centro Cultural Museo y Memoria en El Tume. Can we play the video on this slide, please? La Veleidosa. La Veleidosa is a mining pit located 15 kilometers away from the city of Tocopilla. In October of 1973, a military proclamation reported that a group of detainees was murdered when trying to escape into the mine. The so-called Ley de Fugas was used as a justification for their actions. This law allowed extrajudicial executions during the alleged escapes of prisoners and was applied countless times throughout the country in the first months of the dictatorship. Years later, Pirquineros, or independent miners, found what they described as a pile of bodies in the mine. And different organization efforts and different organization efforts began to locate the place. But in 1975 and 1978, the pit was dynamited by the dictatorship, making it impossible to identify the bodies or carry out any investigations. However, in 1990, thanks to a complaint by the Tocopilla Human Rights Commission, a judicial investigation, excavation, and search began. The remains of four people were found. Carlos Garay, Luis Segovia, Agustin Villarroel Cárcamo, and Claudio Toñola. Large-scale weavings of the four political executees found in the mine, plus Freddy Araya and Reinaldo Aguirre, who were killed but then taken to the morgue, were installed in the hill next to the mine, while smaller weavings of Luis Gómez, Manuel Muñoz, and Vitalio Mutarello, who are still disappeared detainees, were given to their daughters Ale, Angie, and Fabiola, that 50 years later continue searching for their fathers. As part of the museography installed on the site, uh, we designed signs and other didactics that facilitate the information to a broader, pu broader public, the highway sign. This sign is permanently installed in the fork off the main highway to the road towards the mine, engaging a broader demographic of viewers and complicating a landscape that might have been seen as neutral and making visible the site that the dictatorship tried to disappear. The design is based on a sign made in 1990 by the family members of the political prisoners from Calama who had to scratch or comb the desert for some indication of the whereabouts of their relatives. The vertical projection map of La Veleidosa. By means of material remains, La Veleidosa refused to disappear and told the stories that the police tried to hide. The murder and disappearance of people by throwing them in the pit and the attempt of getting rid of any evidence by dynamiting the place year later. Utilizing the vertical projection of the mine from the original investigation, this visualization of the internal architecture of the pit shows the biological and cultural remains found in different levels of the mine between July and October of 1990. The investigation was carried out uh, to uh, approximately 500 meters, leaving 100 meters and 10 tons of material unturned still. The timeline of La Veleriosa. This timeline was designed not only to inform the public about the process of searching for people in the mine, but also to recognize the ongoing labor of the family members of the disappeared detainees who continue looking for their loved ones 50 years later. In fact, since the timeline was printed, the recently formed Agrupación de Familiares de Víctimas de Tocopilla filed a new lawsuit for illegal burial and exhumation, and in December 2023, the search work resumed at the mine and elsewhere in the Atacama Desert. The pedagogical kit. 
This material was written in conjunction with teachers from Tocopilla and seeks to promote the collective awareness of the facts of forced disappearance during the dictatorship in the city. This kit is composed of three envelopes, one for each disappeared detainee in Tocopilla. The central question of this kit is how do you look for a disappeared detainee? Therefore, the envelopes contain documents from the judicial cases, press archives, photographs, and personal accounts of family members. Here, the response of eighth grade class, uh, Escuela Bernardo Higgins, and their teacher, Diana Gonzalez, who visited the installation at La Veleidosa and used the kits to complete the objectives of the national curriculum in su the subject of history and geography. Yeah, and could you start? Yeah. This is a baby comrade there. <laughs> uh, I can't read it, but y'all can read. No, that's okay. Uh, the next site was uh, La Providencia, which is a site of memory located in the city of Antofagasta. Uh, the building is a former convent and was built in the early 1900s and used by the Chilean police uh, intelligence service as a secret headquarters for political detention and torture between 1973 and 1986. The piece is a 25-yard long copper wire weaving of the 106 people killed in the context of uh, the Caravana de la Muerte, or the Caravan of Death, uh, which was an army convoy that executed social leaders and activists in the early days of the dictatorship. The piece was installed down the wall of the site onto the central yard, which is shared with the students of the police academy. To illustrate the route of uh, the Caravana de la Muerte uh, that it traveled, the team designed a map uh, with the path and the names of the people who were disappeared or killed in the beginning of the dictatorship by this convoy. Although the official count of people murdered by the caravan is 26 in the south and 71 in the north, after looking through several archives, talking to relatives and human rights groups, the team accounted for a total of 106 political executees and disappeared detainees. Uh, many times uh, when talking about collective cases within the dictatorship, uh, the protagonists lose their individuality and the broad blanket of victim uh, replaces their humanity. Uh, the association of relatives of the political executees and disappeared detainees of Antofagasta lent us several personal objects that belonged to some of the people killed in the context of the death caravan, uh, which were exhibited to show a human side um, and personal dimension to the people portrayed in the weavings. Uh, we also archived, uh, we also showed archives of the search and work done uh, by the association over the years. As part of creating the website for this project, we also created an archive section on the website, uh, including the archival material from uh, La Providencia. Uh, this is especially important in the Chilean context since the dictatorship not only disappeared people, but also archives such as books, records, and any cultural production uh, that could be deemed Marxist. Uh, it is for this reason uh, that what we have uh, is from groups and institutions in the United States. Uh, for example, uh, we added an archive which was from the University of Maryland and contained evidence of the role of the AFL-CIO and free market unionism in the coup and covert actions and, and surveillance during the dictatorship. As the project continues uh, to collect archival material, this archive will continue to grow, change, and adapt. Uh, so the next site in this project was uh, Londres 38. Uh, Londres 38 is a house in uh, Santiago Centro, uh, built in 1925 and was used for residential purposes until 1970, when it was purchased and used as headquarters for the Socialist Party until 1973. Uh, between 1973 and 1975, the house was used as a place of uh, political detention, torture, and extermination center 
uh, by the National Intelligence uh, Dic uh, Dictorate, or DINA, uh, which was the secret police of the civil military dictatorship. Uh, the piece uh, was, uh, the ex exhibition of Woven Memory at Londres 38 uh, was composed by a sound installation of 98 individual uh, portraits woven in copper wire and cotton thread. Uh, when connected to speakers, uh, the copper in the pieces amplified uh, the voices, footsteps, AM, FM frequencies, and electromagnetic fields, uh, generating a soundscape that commemorates the silenced gesture of the 98 people that are known to have been detained, disappeared, politically executed, or died as a result of torture at Londres 38. Uh, of those, uh, of these people, uh, 80 of them were under the age of 30, and 43 of them were under the age of 25. Uh, so now we have a, a video of uh, the sound installation. Uh, using data collected by the Woven Memory team about the political executees uh, and detained disappeared in Londres, um, Londres 38, uh, we, we worked to create a visualization of the tra trajectories of oppression uh, that they experienced before being killed. Each trajectory contains their starting location, where they lived or worked, uh, the locations in which they were detained, uh, different detention or torture centers uh, they went through, and where the remains were found if they were found. Uh, we built this in the form of a web application uh, to help make uh, the information accessible to all. Uh, the information can be queried uh, to aid in the search of patterns in the data. At the moment, users are able to search the data based on age, name, militancy affiliations, dates of detention, and locations of detention. Uh, as a software engineer, I strongly believe in uh, the model of continuous delivery, which is to say that uh, the software should be continuously delivered to users, uh, but is constantly evolving. So what you see here today was not what was here yesterday and also is not what will be here tomorrow. Uh, as the software evolves based on user feedback, um, we hope to add greater flexibility to query data and to continue adding support for data beyond the scope of Londres. Um, which is why we've included a form to collect data and um, hope to grow the scope of the map. Uh, right now, we have a relatively small data set of roughly 100 people. Um, however, in the long term, we hope to, uh, this application can serve as a database of persecution in Chile and globally. And with a larger data set, we can begin to use other data science to make greater inferences about the disappearance, uh, about the disappeared and executed. Uh, for example, uh, by Understanding where people of certain affiliations or people who are detained in certain locations were ultimately found, uh, we may be able to help determine where others who are, were not found may be.
en el Tume. The Centro de Cultura, Museo y Memoria en el Tume, Cultural Center, Museum and Memory en el Tume, seeks to promote the history of the Cordillera territories by bringing attention to the exploitation of timber workers and the native forests in the region. The museum also highlights the legacy of unions and the role they played during the government of La Unidad Popular and the political violence committed during the dictatorship. The town of Neltume is a beacon in the history of workers' rights in Chile. The town itself was created through a system of inquilinaje, a Chilean agricultural system derived from colonialism where an inquilino is a laborer who is permanently in debt to the landlord that allowed them to live in their property and in return the inquilino worked without salary or for chips that could be exchanged for food and other essentials only at the landlord's pulperia. Although the inquilinaje as an institution was abolished in Chile by the uh, land reform of the 1960s, it wasn't until the early 70s that students who were adherents of the MIR, Revolutionary Left Movement, came to the area and explained their rights to the workers, since most of them were illiterate. In 1971, during the popular unity government of Salvador Allende, the lands were expropriated from those landlords and the Complejo Forestal Maderero Panguipulli was inaugurated with more than 3,000 employees. The company created a plan for sustainable development and responsible forest management, avoiding monoculture and the substitution of native species. The workers started receiving salaries and were able to establish unions that protected these rights. This is in 1971, like, I don't know, we're talking about that now, and anyways. All of these lasted until the dictatorship. Oppressive agents took over the territories and many were killed or are still disappeared. It is in this context that the MIR starts the Operación Retorno, or the Operation Return. In 1977, militants of the revolutionary left movement who were in exile began a process of la operación retorno. To re-enter the country, they had to adopt different identities and remained undercover so that they weren't killed by the dictatorship. This booklet is based on a notebook that belonged to Jose, where he described this process. And in addition to using the original images of the notebook and handwritten notes by Jose, the booklet contains a compilation of interviews by Beatriz, Luis, Jaime, and Rodrigo, who were surviving participants of the operation. The booklet was produced in collaboration with Tamara, the daughter of Jose. Within this framework, the MIR created the Destacamento Guerrillero Toki Lautaro, the Toki Lautaro Guerrilla Detachment, with the participation of 25 militants who were tasked to recover the lands taken by the dictatorship. On June 27, 1981, after a year and a half of their presence in the mountains, the detachment was ambushed and surrounded by the military. During approximately six months, the combatants tried to regroup, but 11 of them were killed in the surrounding areas of the mountain, and two of them were later assassinated in other places of the town. Every year, the museum organizes a gathering in which they commemorate the lives of the people in the destacamento by doing the Ruta de la Memoria of 1981, the memory route of 1981, and visiting the places where each member was killed. The last day of the encuentro, or meeting, people visit the campgrounds where they stayed in the mountains for about 18 months. For this iteration of woven memory, the team installed the weavings depicting 13 militants, the th these 13 militants in the campground in the mountain. The weavings of Paine, Quincha, Campito, Pablo, Jorge, Camilo, Victor, Pedro, Oscar, Rigo, Gabriel, Pequeco, Raul, and Jose were donated to the museum and a part of a permanent exhibition.
the birds were talking yeah between them so so far yeah um yeah that that's our presentation but i also uh so uh the videos were a little the color correction wasn't done yet because i just arrived from chile two weeks ago but i'm working with uh nancy lee and we're doing a piece of the piece which will be showed in canada uh, it is a video, uh, audio-visual piece. We still don't know, you know. Um, but, uh, yeah, so that's the future, the, the near future of the project. Um, but, yeah, that's it. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. Buenos días, good morning. Hello, I am Maria Jose Murillo. I'm an artist and cultural worker from Peru. I'm delighted to be here today to share a bit about my practice and the textile collective No Canchis, which I co-founded in 2021 with Alipio Melo and Anitza Wilka, prominent young weavers from the Peruvian Andes. It's such a great honor to be part of this powerful panel moderated by Jadia Badri. My profound gratitude to her, to the Sharjah Art Foundation, and to the exceptional team and workers behind March Meeting 2024. Thanks to all who are joining us today for contributing to this meaningful experience. I want to start by presenting uh, this map on the right of the territory of South America, showing the great magnitude of the highlands, or the Andes in Spanish. The continent of America, before being named by Europe as such, was once conceived as a unified land of vital blood, where the idea of land and nature was inseparable from human existence. The map on the left depicts the ex extent and geographical organization of the Inca culture until the Spain Spanish inva invasion of indigenous lands in Peru in 1532. The description explains that the Inca territory, now known as Tahuantinsuyo, uh, Tawa is four and Suyu is region, uh, was organized into four parts, not according to the cardinal points, but based on the Andean people's bioclimatic conception of the world. These divisions were related to climate uh, categories, such as warm, temperate, cold, and dry weather. The division of Tahuantinsuyu was simple, natural, and stable, enabling the efficient administration of such a vast culture. In present-day Peru, the art and cultural legacy inherited from this ancestral Andean society, the greatest culture in the history of textiles, described by Annie Albers, the modernist weaver, has been omitted from our artistic educational system with textiles art, textile arts being the most silenced and excluded. Traditional materials such as plant and animal fibers, as well as haptic and cognitive processes that condensed knowledge by establishing deep relationships with the community and natural environment, such as spinning, natural dyeing, and weaving, have been largely excluded from the curriculum of our local art schools. This omission of the textile arts as an expressive medium in of itself is rooted in a hierarchical differentiation imposed by the Western world, which labels itself modern as it continues to separate art from craft, contemporary for, from traditional, mind from body, and reason from emotion. Throughout my years as an art student in Peru, I was limited by my professors to cover the surface of a textile with pigment under a westernized understanding of color, art, and my culture, without ever hearing about the important textile legacy of our ancestors. 
Imagine that in the 1950s, modernist weavers like Sheila Hicks studied pre-Columbian art at Yale University and other art departments, while Peru still lacks textile or weaving programs within our art schools. My fortuitous encounter with the language of weaving, weaving occurred five years ago while pursuing an MFA in studio at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago through the Fiber and Material Studies Department. The approach to textile processes and discussions surrounding the Andean textile outside my country within contemporary art discourse sparked an internal revolution. This moment of simultaneous fulfillment and crisis marked the beginning of an emancip emancipatory process for both my artistic practice and myself. My unexpected reunion with Weaving as a Peruvian contemporary artist unleashed something I had never experienced before as a maker, the truest recognition of myself through an, an art medium. Gradually, the voices of the indigenous ancestral horizon, historically and systematically anesthetized, began to speak to me. I started to perceive and decipher its language, as millenary as it is living and dynamic, by learning to feel and think through the language of weaving. At SAIC, I learned to weave within a program that's, that has its origins in the Bauhaus School under the legacy of Annie Albers. Through first-hand observation of pre-Hispanic textiles, Annie Albers, Annie Albers was marveled by the sophisticated visual, structural, and technological aspects developed by her great teachers, the weavers of ancient Peru, as she called them on some occasions and colleagues on others. Albers fought for the recognition of weaving and the textile, textile medium as high art arguing for a return to the source, to that originary moment, highlighting the medium specificity of onion textiles as the most honest expression. Through her connections to archeologists, such as Junius Bird and her trips to Latin America, having visited Peru only once, she amassed a collection of over a hundred Andean textile pieces. However, it is known that Albers uh, unraveled some uh, pre-Columbian textiles to analyze their structures and replicate them, evidence of her disconnection with the living world of that primitive other in the eyes of modernist artists, and her lack of understanding of the continuity of Andean weaving as an ongoing language and matrix for cultural identity. My pilgrimage uh, through weaving guided me back to the Andes, to the highlands, to approach its language through its root and epistemic dimension. Throughout the past years, I have explored the transition from European origin looms, like the floor loom and the digital jacquard loom, to the ancestral backstrap loom. These tools and their different processes have enabled me to engage in a, different, in a diverse dialogue with weaving, perceiving it as a container or or a vessel where contradictions can coexist and intertwine horizontally within the textile grid. Through my textile practice, I seek to navigate the continuous challenge of inhabiting such a complex and contra contra contradictory culture identity as mestizaje. In Latin America, mestizaje, conceived as cultural fusion, has been used as a whitening strategy to erase and, ge and reject the indigenous horizon that is alive within us. From an, an anti-colonial perspective, the Bolivian educator, sociologist, and writer, Silvia Rivera Cusicanqui, describes mestizaje as cheje, subjectivity. Cheje meaning in Aymara, motley or variegated. In other words, a stained subjectivity formed by uh, heterogeneous sources brought, to, brought together without uh, harmony. I have been particularly interested in understanding and expressive, expressing myself through an Andean technique called lei payay. Although today it's part of the textile repertoire of the Andean weavers in the Cusco region, it is not a pre-Hispanic uh, indigenous technique properly. On the contrary, 
it was introduced or imposed with a colonial invasion. While learning to weave through this technique, I realized that the plain weave was called Chechche by the weavers in Cusco, which in Quechua also means motley or composed by two contradictory colors that never mixed up. I then made the connection with what uh, Rivera Cusicanqui proposes as mestizaje cheje, coming from the Aymara. The cheje, or chechchi in Quechua, is a metaphor clearly linked to textiles and comes from this specific technique, lei paye. It is when threads of opposite colors are joined to create a third color, but which only in appearance is a third color because it maintains the nature of the two opposing elements. For Rivera, Rivera Cusicanqui, this describes very well our experience of colonialism as something internal, but also internalized in our subjectivity, where two epistemes, uh, two ways of knowing and uh, being in the world and seeing the world are in permanent confli conflict and clash. One that has a Eurocentric root and the other that belongs to the pre-Hispanic indigenous horizon. The lay paya uh, technique is only one-sided, it's not reversible. In the Andes, the back side is never considered by the weavers in this specific technique because the threads hang loosely. They are traditional indigenous techniques are double-faced, conceiving the textile in its full dimensionality as a living being. I am interested in navigating between both sides within the, this technique, between the front and the back, to return, to turn the textile around and find myself not only through the face, but also through the part that is hidden between the loose threads. In the ongoing process of working towards an emancipated anti-colonial mestizaje, I always keep alive a phrase from Silvia Rivera Cusicanqui, who encourages us Latin Americans to radicalize the contradiction that composes us, to make this contradiction a source of energy, almost like a metaphor for electricity. We would then have the possibility of rediscovering this alterity in ourselves and connecting in new ways with each other. After this period in Chicago, my approach to Andean weaving has been greatly nourished from its roots. I moved to Cusco in 2019 uh, Cusco is the city of my father, to be in charge uh, of the education department of the Centro de Textiles Tradicionales del Cusco. The Center for Traditional Textiles of Cusco, or CTTC, is a pioneer organization in the re revitalization and sustainable practice of the Peruvian ancestral textile in the Cusco region, founded by indigenous weavers from the district of Chinchero. Since 1996, the center has promoted the empowerment of weavers to maintain their textile identity and traditions alive through significant projects such as the recovery of ancestral techniques, uh, weaving techniques that were at risk of extinction. Today, it works with 10 associations from different weaving communities and districts around the Cusco region. The vital work of the CTTC continues to be essential in the development of Andean textile art in Peru. It was through this organization and by my, the guidance of Nilda Cayañaupa, its founder and director, that I had access to rich, generous, and dynamic ecosystem of contemporary artists in the Andes. My job involved working on projects with over 500 adult weavers and 250 young weavers from 10 associations. Engaging with this vibrant art world open up a new approach to what I conceived as contemporary art. It nurtured me through a different logic of living, creating, growing and sharing that resonates with the essence of the Andean weaving process of creation, which reciprocity is at its core. Throughout those years, I, de I developed a close friendship with Alipio Melo and Danitza Wilka, young weavers from the CTTC, CTTC, both representing the district of Pitumarca, known as the capital of Andean weaving. Pitumarca is two hours away from Cusco City by car. During that period, Danis Danitza was part of the young weavers group, as you can see in the picture on top, 
uh, called Muna Itikia Weaving Association, one of the first associations to collaborate with the center. Alipio, uh, on the other hand, he at that moment recently transitioned to the Adult Weavers Group of Pitumarca, of the same community, and currently serves as its president. He is one of the best young weavers in Cusco. In 2021, the pandemic uh, shifted paradig paradigms uh, bringing us together with the purpose of forming an artist collective. Rooted in our deep connection and passion for Andean weaving, our aim is to interlace our worldviews and experiences as co contemporary textile artists. No Canchis, the name of our collective, is Quechua for all of us. It represents an inclusive us that is dis distinct from No Kaiku, also in Quechua, which denotes a restrictive us. Unlike Western languages, Quechua uses the same root for I, Noka, and as no kanchis or no kaiku, revealing the inseparable, in, inseparable bond between the individual and the community in the construction of Andean identity. Now it's the time for Danitza to introduce herself. Imainaya, Alian Chupasenkis. Yeah, Noka Sutimi, Danitza Wilke Espinosa, Noka Mami Taimanta Nasimurani, Yenapi. Ulya is a kiss Noka, Imenata Mami Taipuisampi Noka Kamakurani. Noka Kamakuni, Mami Taipa Wisampi Aitukuna, and Tejitukuna, and Palekuna, Aina. Imanati Ninkis. Imanahti, porque no cata mamá y un coja coja chachti, mi mamá en normal ya agua cara, un pusca cara, y matas normal ya chi agua y manta agua cara. Chay pita mi no ca forma coni, anchiwa mi no ca agua y pa inspiras con hina can. Igual mami ta y pa mami ta y tapas, ya chachiran a tu mamá chay, chunca guata chaman tapacha agua y ta. Y chay rey con no cae cupa. Kai awai of malkisape na hamu ya pa nya nya kuna pakturai kuna pakwa. Chaliata wujari ami kits noka. Kuna noka kashani chunka. Iskai chunka watayo. Chau. Alipio will also share his journey as a weaver. Bueno, mi nombre es Alipio Melo Erco, y soy de Pitumarca. Y no cata ni con Aguilla Cuita Monani, y menos no cata en historieta, ¿no? Y menos que agua ya está ahí, más o menos. Que agua está no cae chada ni desde ocho y ni manta pacha no porque no cae cae co agua está camanta mana no cae co que ni por cara y cura chida chara cae co agua está cae más porque mamá y pas o abuelita y pas chay iba a poner y chay iba a poner y lo cavaran cops o aquí mi hermana está y con algo para si y con el carro no entonces no cae chada ni agua está los siete años ocho años ya Waktu cakap nak tulur ada ni, no, tulur ayat ni mana rani. I perlu mana mami tadi tak harawan sih nak tulur ayat, kerana mana aje ruan nak kira hari kau nak ruan aja, seperti wajib kau nak posisi nak kau najap. I perlu nak kami nyusut gusta rau, i cai tulur ayat ni hinas pa. Ya cara ni, no, kerana mana mami tadi mana rani, cakap algo ruah kips makah, ruah pinjak, ruah hebat pa, macam cai tulur ayat mana kampus ruan ayat kicu nasi. 
pero no por ahí te ponen una cana y para allá, pero una cana y acharo dan y acharos pe, señor Nilda Vargas Nacos pe, pa invitar a un grupo de niños que no caran pito mal capi. He nantado a tu por más que acá ya te no cae por ahí ya se suma y tía y Ana invitaba a los pa ir chiquitín de casa, pa ir se invita ya rovante, pero mana hay con el paso pinza gran y solo está ahí alcanza pues para ir con él y no para pelear chasne pero ahí con él no abajo con mano chay pichu ya chasne y gustaba eran demasiado tan agua y porque ahí corrosa vendieron el paso de hiruita y vendieron el paso de nuestra colo que te recorrone y más estamos dando con que tan no solo que le aman casi que tan ya es que tan ya es que no ni con más ánimo roan y chay pinza gran y quién sabe todo es que va a tener que ir a un grupo de niños ya me mandan señora ni la meterán grupo de adultos no pasará chon porque grupo de niños mana reconoce pacho cualquier momento chingará por tener que mana ya he dicho que la página está en orden pasa por ahí a los 17 o 16 años ah pasa por ahí y ya me manda no ya he pillan can y ya en caso de no caer mal tapas escribir con y bueno, no como amigos estaban que ir hasta allá con mana con cara y cuya chuminita me piden que con el pistar chum chumero ahí ni ahí ahí está porque ya está ahí pero pues quizás no van cuya porque igual me roban a chay que ahí además no por el mojado ni aguan hay que tener cosas asociación y ni 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 con apes no compañero con apes así para abajo o aquí en cuya acá por porque no caja ni ni con apes hay por cama asociación más por el tema no ni guata pas chum ni es que hay que ya para su aquí antes de morar con ya para chilear con los que está por cama y chayna ya no y mano no en cualquier país hasta con un cambio de decisión y voy a seguir siempre en ese grupo hasta el final Our first major project together was to give an online lecture for my art school in Chicago in 2021. The lecture was titled Nokanchi Sawahkuna, translated to We the Weavers. Ironically, this marked the first occasion that the fiber department uh, in the School of the Art Institute of Chicago hosted Andean artists to discuss Andean weaving. The purpose of the talk was to establish a platform for Alipio and Anitza as weavers from Pitumarca to speak from their most personal perspectives, thereby ch challenging the historical representations that the Western world has imposed on indigenous culture. We shared insights on how weaving is lived in the Andes, not only as an activity, but also as an episteme, establishing relationships between the earth beings and the cosmos, between the past and the future. Here you can see the posters of the lecture in three languages, as the lecture was presented uh, in Quechuan Spanish uh, with live transcriptions to English. The lecture focused on sharing about the chain of creation of the Andean textile, which is not only considered as an object for Andean people, but also as subject. Starting with the Pacocha Chuyay, a grand celebration in the Andes where Pachamama and the Apus, the sacred mountains, are thanked to seek blessings for the alpacas which are family members as well. The palcha, a sacred highland flower, which you can see on the top, showers over the alpacas to ensure they are well-being and flourishing. In Quechua, the verb uiwai means to raise and shares the same word for uiwa, which means animal. As the great uh, Elvira Espejo mentions, from the inception of the Andean weaving process, a mutual nurturing relationship is established between animals and humans, what she refers to as crianza mutua. The process continues with, with the Wilma Rutui from November to December. When the fiber has just been cut, it still has life. It shouldn't be spun for three or four months because it's alive. 
Then we uh, showed uh, more about the process of natural dyeing, when nature not only shares its colors, but the different plants, insects, and lichen speaks through them, through the color in itself. Uh, the, we, the warping process, I am just passing really quick now, but we made it with a great detail, this process of the chain of, of the onion weaving. Uh, the warping process always counted in pairs of threads and carried out in pairs, like you can see there, uh, the wife and the husband. It's a reciprocal action where permission from Pachamama and the Apus is sought to begin warping, as it means the beginning of the weaving, the weaving's life. Going through the various stages of growth, closely connected to nature and agriculture, until it gains a life of its own. The textile has been born. It serves not only as a companion in this life, but also accompanies us to the next. Weaving represents the identity of the weavers. When seeing a specific textile, it is like seeing the face of the person who wove it. From 2021 to 2023, Alipio and I were part of a textile project called Serpayai. This aside from our collective Nokanchis. Uh, we worked along white, uh, no, with eight other artist weavers from the CPTC. The project revolved around the creation of Andean textile iconography known as Payay in Quechua. This project aimed to reconsider the collaborative relationships between the academically trained artists, such as me, and traditional trained artists, such as Alipio and Danitza in Peru. While seeking to disorder the hierarchies between art and craft in the local artist, artistic context. The exhibition was presented also in Lima two years later, highlighting the process of creation and collaboration. One of our latest projects with Nocanchis has involved deepening the relationship between textile, writing, and language. When I was learning the process of weaving following traditional Andean methodology, it was crucial for me to simultaneously learn Quechua or Runasimi. It's also known as Runasimi uh, in Quechua. Defining the notion of a non-literate culture imposed by the Western perspectives on indigenous societies. I came to understand that both languages, the weaving language and Runasimi, uh, the woven and the oral, are inseparable from each other. One materializes the other's orality through various writing systems in the form of textile vocabularies. For example, one of them could be kipu. Kipu is only one of the multiple writing systems that existed in our pre-Columbian uh, society. The Runasimi or Quechua spoken today in Cusco is not the same as the one spoken during the pre-Hispanic era in indigenous Peru. It, it embodies the linguistic transformations that has survived from the colonial period, characterized as Quechua mestizo, revealing uh, the significant clash and conflict between the Western and indigenous uh, cultures. One aspect that deeply perturbed me uh, while learning uh, Quechua was to say, I don't know how to read, which in Quechua is expressed as manang nyawi chukani, translating literally to, I don't have eyes. This statement becomes, becomes disturbing, ironic, and painful when reflecting on the importance, importance of that gaze and vision that uh, revolutionized the textile medium forever. From the artists of ancient Peru to contemporary Andean crea creators, through that you know, genealogy of ice, the most important textile manifestations of all time have been gestated. In the Andes, uh, one not only sees through the eyes, but also through the hands. From that tactile, sensitive, and deep gaze with others, uh, with over 5,000 years of artistic continuity, the most significant ways of seeing and understanding the world have been developed from the specificity of the language of weaving. With No Canchis, our project titled Si Tenemos Ojos, Nyawiyoj Mi Canchis, translated to We Do Have Eyes, was based on a Rimanakui, uh, a traditional Andean practice, practice focused on, a, on reciprocal dialogue. That took place in Pitumarca, where Alipio and Anitza comes from. 
We were accompanied by Senor Domingo Wilca, Danitza's father, Georgina Maldonado, my Quechua mentor, Nelly Dairco, Alipio's sister, and her daughter, Amira, Florencia Portocarrero, the curator who, who invited us to participate in the project for La Escuela, a Latin, America, a Latin American digital platform, and artists, friend, friends, Beropchan, Martin, Rich, Rixe, were part of the Rimanacui. Here you can see the poster of La Escuela. It was called Aulas eh, Tejidos del Futuro, Textiles from the Future, Redes de Diálogo y Colaboración en Torno al Arte Textil en Latinoamérica. Along us, uh, there were other participants, participants like the collective Silat, uh, coming from Salta, Argentina, with the Wichi weaving, and Helen Ascoli and Luisa Gonzalez Reiche, and Nick McCoy from Guatemala. <laughs> Alongside the Rimanacui, uh, we began to create our first co authored textile installation. As, as the initial iteration of the project, Si Tenemos Ojos, We Do Have Eyes. Uh, shaped like a kipu, it involves the creation of an archive exclu exclusively composed of eye fragments from Peruvian textile art dating from the earliest pre-Hispanic cultures to the present day. It has been important for us to explore uh, and express ourselves through the tapestry technique, the weft uh, face technique that was recently recovered by the CTTC in a project that I developed with director Nilda. In the Cusco region, the ancient technique mastered by the Wari, Tiwanaku, Inca cultures, among others, was not part of the Andean repertoire until only some years ago. Here you can see some details of the installation woven by Danitza, Alipio, and me. Our ongoing project proposes establishing spaces to reflect on the socio-cultural significance of ICE the division between the literate dominant world and the illiterate, as well as different forms of literacy that go beyond alphabetic literacy, such as textile, indigenous, and heterogeneous literacies. Uh, thank you very much. You can find Nokanchis and each of our personal practices on Instagram. Hi everyone, um, first of all, thank you to the whole team at staff for making this happen and for creating this beautiful panel. Um, and thank you to all of you for being so patient. Um, I just wanna maybe like uh, do a little chant before I start. So I'm gonna say free, free and you're gonna say Palestine, okay? Free, free. Palestine. Free, free. Palestine. Free, free. Palestine. Thank you. Um, so my name is Yasmin. I'm Palestinian American. I come from uh, Nord Collective. Um, and uh, I'll be discussing uh, our work with Nord Collective today. So Nord Collective works with a network of artisans and producers all over Palestine. So this is just a little visual map of the network. Um, so we work with printers, weavers, uh, tailors, and embroiderers. Um, and just for the sake of um, kind of understanding, I've, I've put like the major cities, like Ramallah, Gaza, Nablus. Actually, Ramallah's not even on there, but that's, oh yeah, it is, okay. Um, but we actually work with um, producers in refugee camps and smaller villages that would be around these, these bigger cities and towns. Um, and so we work with uh, small businesses, family owned, women's cooperatives, and then women who also work in the home. Um, so we don't work with uh, bigger factories. Um, and, for the, and the reason for that is, you know, you hear something made in Palestine or handmade or made by women, and we just assume that it's ethical and that's 
that's not the case. You know, capitalism is very much alive and well in the global south and in Palestine. So um, by working with smaller family-owned shops and uh, by working with women who work in the home, um, we kind of just ne like avoid working with practices that take advantage spe specifically of women um, and their, their labor. So our mission kind of comes down to three elements. So first, we want to illuminate the politics around fashion. Um, for us, we don't divorce the garment from the political context of the people who are making it. Um, secondly, we want to bring our audience into the design process. So normally, you know, there's someone who might harvest the cotton and then someone who weaves the cotton and then someone who sells the fabric and no, no, no. it's a very long network of people. But then when you come to buy the garment, you literally have no idea. You're not involved in the process. So the idea for us at Noel is to be able to bring the audience, bring the customer into the design process and the production process so that you kind of have more of a responsibility because when you don't know what's happening to the people that are making your clothing, it's very easy for them to be taken advantage of. Um, so when you're involved and you're aware, you have more of a responsibility, which is what we believe you should have. And lastly, we want to redefine the relationships that we have with our clothes and the people who make them so that it's not this hierarchy of I'm paying you money and you work for me. Um, it's very much like I said, you're, you're involved in the production process and that the goal is to be able to shift the power dynamics between the buyers and the producers. So by so the way we think about this is through intersectional fashion. So you might have heard of intersectionality as it comes to terms with feminism, for example. But of course, intersectionality is the way we should be thinking about everything in the world, including fashion. So we start with the garment, and then we think about the labor. So f for example, an embroidered garment would be hand embroidered for hours by a woman who is embroidering, but cooking, but cleaning, so on and so forth. So we want to illustrate the labor that goes into the garment. We want to talk about the culture, like how these traditional crafts are so deeply embedded in Palestinian culture. And then we want to talk about the politics. So of course in Palestine, we live under occupation and we have done so for the last 75 years and that has radically impacted the people who make our clothes, but also the, the practice itself, the crafts, the embroidery has radically shifted. Um, under the weight and the forces of occupation. So we, we do our best to illustrate all of these, these elements and how they intersect with, with the garment. And so we do that through three ways. So first we do storytelling. So we're, of course, we're on Instagram, we're on TikTok. We do a lot of videos that are like, it's a series called political fashion videos. So um, we'll take like a, like, okay, why is, what's the story behind this t-shirt? And um, in the video, we'll talk about everything, like the people who are making it, the heritage, the history, the politics, um, and that's all in a three minute long TikTok, but just to give people an idea of how to think about clothing in a really different way. Education, so we do a lot of educational posts, just talking about very specific crafts. Um, and then transparency, so on our website, when you, go to look at a product page, it's very clear who's made it. You know, in, like this, this photo here, these are the hands of Imma Ibrahim. She's a grandmother of 13 children, the newest one born six months ago. Everyone knows that on Instagram. She's embroidered your t-shirts. Um, so but like, again, with the transparency, the idea is because you're sort of forming a relationship with this woman, you, it shifts your expectations for production. So for example, the other day when, I think she was making a, a scarf, I called her to ask, you know, how is it coming along? And she says, okay, well, we had a death in the neighborhood. It's a small village, so the entire village goes, it has so delayed by a few days because she's making food for the family. She's, she's very much pausing her production because when you're working at home, you're not, you're not an employee. Like your goals, your life isn't, isn't lived around production. So, okay, production is pushed three days. So then we have to go back to our emails. We email customers. We're like, okay, so this is what happened. Your order will be delayed by so-and-so days. And the idea is 
they're humans first. They're a neighborhood, a community first, and then they're producers really last. So just terms, in case you're not familiar with these words, uh, write them down, because I will be using them throughout the pre presentation. So tatriz is the Arabic word for uh, embroidery. It includes many types of embroidery, but today I'll be focusing specifically on cross-stitch embroidery. And thob is a dress, a traditional dress. It, it sometimes has embroidery, but not always. But today when I use the word thob, I'll be referring to ones that do have embroidery. And the reason I'm not gonna say cross-stitch embroidery and I'm not gonna say dress is because when you translate the word into English, you end up losing a lot of the nuance and the power that comes with the original word. So we'll be using tatriz and thob today. Um, so I view tatriz as an embroidered language. It, it is a language um, because it is used to express so many things. So it's, it, the language was formed by the lives of women and it's formed by the natural landscape around those women. So um, just as an example, you know, we wouldn't need to speak. If you're wearing a, a traditional thob without having to speak, you can look at the woman and you'll know, oh, she's from Gaza. You can tell by the colors she's used, by the motifs she's used. You can tell if she's married. You can tell if she's single. Like you can read the dress, the thob, as a literal like biography. Um, so it is a language, and as all languages do, there are dialects. So dialects within various regions of Palestine. So you'll have a dialect in Gaza, a dialect in Ramallah, a dialect in, in Yafa, and so on. Um, so that's kind of the framework that we'll be using to think about embroidery today. So here are some of the dialects, for example. This is Gaza on the far left, Bir Saba, which is in the desert, uh, in the south of Palestine, in the middle, and Ramallah on the right. And as you can see, even though it's all one language, the dialects are so distinct. Um, and so when you kind of get more familiar with embroidery, you can just look at a dress with, with these colors and specific motifs and you'll be like, oh, okay, yes, I know this, you're from here, you're from here. Um, and just to be a bit more specific, so this is the Gaza, a, a an example of a Gaza thobe. Um, as you can see, it's pink, which is like very special to Gaza. And the reason it's pink is because they used to make their natural dyes from crushed seashells because Gaza, of course, is on the sea. Um, so the Gaza region is very uh, renowned for that specific pink and purple color. And they're also famous for, example, uh, birds, because on the, seashell, on the seashore, there's um, birds with migratory patterns that will come uh, different seasons. And so to reflect that, there are a lot of bird motifs, um, as I said. Ramallah. Ramallah is famous for having the white linen dress and the red embroidery, for example. Bir Saba, which is one of my favorite ones, just because um, they're the most, uh, like, they have the most embroidery of any region. Their dress will be so rich and intricate with embroidery. It takes months and months and months to embroider one of these dresses. And um, as you can see here on the left, there's blue uh, embroidery on the bottom of the dress, but red embroidery on the top. And that's because if a woman is widowed, for example, she'll cut the embroidery from the bottom of her dress and replace it with the blue. The blue indicates to people around her that she's been widowed. Um, blue also indicates uh, like protection from the evil eye. So, I want to bring you to Beit Dajan. If you haven't heard of it, it's a village near Yaffa. It's about 13 kilometers southwest of Yaffa. Yaffa is on the coast of Palestine. And um, one thing that the Yaffa region was very famous for, and still is today, is the Yaffa orange. Um, and this, of course, extended to the village of Beit Dajan. Um, so because of the blooming um, orange industry, there were orange orchards everywhere and traditions and cultures developed around the oranges and the, the orchards. So Beit Dajan became famous for having the orange blossom motif. So when you see an orange blossom motif, you know this person is from Yafa area, Beit Dajan area. Um, the thing is with Beit Dajan, it was forcibly and violently depopulated in 1948. 
Um, so the village today is in ruins, and then the people who do live there are Israelis. So what happens then to the motif, the archive, when the Palestinians are not there anymore? So this is the Beit Dajan dress, for example. You can see here, it, maybe it's a bit too hard to, to see, but I did put um, in the middle a detail of what the orange blossom motif looks like. So Beit Dajan is, might not be in your, your, like, your mind's vocabulary around Palestine, but we still have and still use this motif. You can find it even in, in uh, thobes that are made today. So the archive, has remained, the, the motif has remained alive, even though the village is not there. Um, and it becomes like a way that we, we keep alive the memory of the village, if that makes sense. So it's become an archive. Speaking of archives, um, it extends beyond just the embroidered motifs and to the actual fabric used on dresses. So El Majdal is a village just north of Gaza, and it was famous for the Majdalawi fabric, which comes from the name of the village, and Majdal. Um, it's this striped fabric here. You can see it, can, it used to come in many colors, um, so, but the most famous is this turquoise and fuchsia combination that was called the heaven and hell combination. Um, it was the weaving capital of Palestine. I mean, it, when I interviewed a weaver, he told me that you, they wove enough there were 800 looms. They wove enough fabric to cover the whole of Palestine. Um, the village was forcibly depopulated in, from 1948 to 1950, and then it was actually destroyed, razed to the ground, and then an Israeli city was built over it, so it no longer exists. Um, so the, the weavers were displaced to many parts, like to Jordan, to the desert, like Bir Saba, as well as to Gaza. It became extremely difficult for them in the refugee camps to keep weaving. They didn't have the resources, the materials, and their children were looking for better ways to support their families financially. So it started to die out. Um, and so today the practice is, the practice is, is kept alive by a handful of weavers, maybe only two or three families in Gaza. Um, but of course, as you know now, they have been displaced, their homes destroyed, their workshops destroyed, so they are now twice displaced. The practice, which was already at the edge of extinction because of how difficult it is for the weavers who are in Gaza to export their fabrics, um, it's, it's threatened now more than ever. Um, but just to show you what it looks like, I mean, you can see like the stripes here, this is the heaven and hell, and this is what it would have looked like here. Um, and because Gaza is so special to have this striped fabric because this is unique to the Gaza region in the south of Palestine. They didn't have as much embroidery as the rest of Palestine because the fabric, the stripes itself were such a vibrant decorative element of the thob. So when you see a striped dress like that, you know it's from Gaza. And this is one of the weavers that we work with in, in Gaza in the old city. So, Continuing the idea of archives, and, and weaving and embroidery are, are archives. So even though Al Majdal village and Beit Dajan village no longer exist as places for Palestinians in Palestine, we have kept the memory alive through the material things, through the embroidered archiving and the, the woven archiving. Um, and as I said, it, it becomes like a way to map Palestine. So as Palestine's map changes under occupation, you know, the apartheid wall goes up and huge swaths of land are, are destroyed and made way for like monocultural practices. And essentially the land is, is mutilated and transformed. The, the archive serves to, to preserve plants because we used to have motif, we still have motifs that are plants that are native to Palestine, villages, so on and so forth. Um, and community. So I mentioned earlier that um, Im Ibrahim, one of the embroiders that we work with, she uh, will stop working for, you know, a, for a funeral, for example, or a wedding, or a, the birth of a grandchild. 
Um, and that's not unique to her. That is how every single person that we work with operates. So I remember one day I went into um, Amos al Aus's workshop in Ramallah. He's a tailor. And I was like, oh, I just got an email. A customer is so upset. They have a birthday of Sar Aish and they're, they're so angry. We need to get this done now. And he was like, shh, sit down. We're going to have a coffee. And it was like there was no sense of urgency. And I was so like heck embarrassed, but also humbled. I was like, oh my goodness, like what? You're not a machine. This customer has can can cancel the order for I for all I care. Like you deserve to come in, in the morning, have your coffee, have your breakfast, chat with your neighbors in the old city, and then you work. Um, you're not a machine. Well, you know what, Yani, this idea that we have to produce as quickly as possible for consumers is something that we started to think about at Noah. Like, why is it that we need everything so quickly? We need it now. I have an event, I have this. But these are practices, whether, he, and he's not even doing embroidery, he's doing tailoring on a sewing machine, but he still has the right to slow fashion. He still has the right to have a life out and reasonable work hours and not work with the pressure of having to work for someone or under someone. So by working with Palestinians all throughout Palestine, in the way that we do, it, it's forced us and by extension our audience to really think about how, about their demands and their expectations when it comes to garments and, and buying things. And the fact that at the end of the day, just because you buy something online on a screen doesn't mean that there's no one behind the process. So again, by co constantly talking about Amus al Aus and Ibrahim or Sutrukeya, all of these people on Instagram, like we're trying to make to keep them in the consciousness of our audience, of our customers, um, so that we really reduce the, this whole I need it now scenario because there's, there's no way that's gonna happen. Um, and we try and do it in a respectful way. For example, Situr Kaya is a cancer survivor and when she told me it would take one month to make woven bags, it took six. And we didn't tell anyone that because at the end of the day, I don't need to tell anyone that she's a cancer survivor because one, it's her business, but two, there should be like a natural sense of empathy for the people that are spending a back-breaking number of hours making our, our products. So when I say community and sustainability, I mean like the way that the global south, not just Palestine, but really like anywhere outside of Europe and the US works it inherently like in our nature before we were colonized is doing it in community, doing it in a sustainable way, doing it so that making money for someone else or even for ourselves wasn't the goal of living, you know? Um, and I say sustainability as well because when you embroider a dress or you hand weave a bag or whatever, it takes so long. You have it for decades. I'm sure there are people here who have their grandmother's uh, clothing or their mother's clothing, or and, and, I, and you're very lucky if you have pieces that they made themselves. But the idea is because it, it's such a slow but laborious process, they're made very well, but they're also infused with such a value that they last generations. And so they are inherently sustainable. You spend six months to make a dress, but you have it for, for decades as opposed to buying a $50 dress and then you throw away the next year. Um, and then again, community, because everything is done in groups. We're not isolated. Um, so women embroider in something we call Tatri's circle, a circle of women who sit together, they share stories, they share song, they bond, they heal, uh, weaving as well. So our practices are inherently community uh, centered and, and sustainable. Something that we're trying to really do through the way that we design and sell our clothing at Noel. So these are just some examples of the things that we make at Noel. Um, I'm not gonna bore you with the products because to be honest, the stars of the show are the producers. Um, this is a video, but I don't know how to play it. But this is just um, a little insight into the people that make the clothes. So on the left, you have uh, Im Jamil or Im Ibrahim. They're embroidering scarves. In the center, this is, this is a weaver in Gaza working on the, some fabric that we used last year. Um, and here, this is um, Im Salam weaving what will eventually become uh, 
this bag or one of these bags. This is a different design. I guess the video doesn't work, does it? Oh, that's okay, I'll move on. Um, and so speaking of Tatri's circles, this is a, um, a circle that we held in our studio maybe three weeks ago now. Um, and so Tatri's, even though it is a huge part of Palestinian uh, culture and heritage and political identity, it's actually dying um, because of a few reasons. I mean, younger women now don't see this as like a means to survive. You know, they wanna, they wanna do very different uh, labor. Um, and so now it's really being kept alive by older women. Um, and that's not being taught in schools. And on top of that, machine em embroidery has sort of started to replace hand embroidery. Machine embroidery is faster, it's cheaper, like, so it's kind of threatened, to be honest. And so we held up a three circle for younger women in, um, in and around Ramallah, and they came, and we talked about politics and our families, and we, like, raged about the North, like, uh, occupation and colonialism. Um, and they learned about embroidery. It was, it was extremely powerful and um, something that we hope to, to keep doing. Um, so I mentioned earlier about how um, Tatriz is, is, is an archive, right? So it archives the land, it archives plants and places. Um, but what happens when it like kind of stays in the past, right? So these are motifs that we've had for generations. We've been using them for generations, but do we update them to reflect the current time? So in 2024, and Palestine is occupied, how is occupation reflected in the visual archive, right? So do we, do, we archi do we make a motif for the apartheid wall? Do we make a motif for tanks? Do we make a motif for soldiers? Um, is it right to do so? Do we want to commemorate that into our visual archive? I don't have the answer if it's right or not, but I did do it and you can see it here. This is um, a piece that we made that says made in Palestine embroidered in the center, and then this red meandering line is the apartheid wall as it surrounds uh, Jerusalem. So the white dot at the top is our studio in Ramallah, and the white dot at the very bottom is Bethlehem, where this hoodie was made. So normally, for us to be able to get to Bethlehem, we would just go straight through Jerusalem. We obviously can't because of the apartheid wall. So we end up having to take a route that goes all the way around the apartheid wall and back. It's like three times as long and you have to go through a checkpoint and it's dehumanizing and it's, it's shitty. Uh, <laughs> it is, it is. Um, and these red dots at the top that are scattered are just some of the, just a few, because there's so many, but just a few of the settlements, the illegal Israeli settlements that are in the West Bank, because this is the West Bank. Um, but yeah, so we did this, and the idea was like, maybe we should start archiving this, because the idea is, if you archive something, does it mean that we need to preserve the struggle as well. We need to make sure that the world knows about what is happening. So it doesn't need to just be the flowers and the birds and this and that. It should be reflecting these, these um, really horrible things as well because when Palestine is freed, I think that we need to make sure that we never forget the struggle that we endured. Um, this is this is really, I'm wrapping it up now. This is the last slide of my talk. I just, this is a video. I don't know if we'll be able to play it. This is um, one of the weavers that we work with in Gaza. Um, he was killed uh, in the beginning of the war. He left behind his wife and his children. Um, can we play the video? His name was Muhammad al-Jamal. He, he worked in um, a weaving studio that was only um, six months old when the war started. Um, it was an initiative to, to keep weaving alive. Um, and I just wanted to honor, honor his memory today and the importance of the work that he did and the other weavers are doing to keep up 
alive um, this part of our identity and our heritage to keep alive the memory of Al Majdal, the village that this fabric comes from. And that's it, thank you. gonna take a big breath <sighs> she's going to look for the video but we're going to try to play it um, I'm mindful of time I want to ask the audience if there are any questions comments anything you want to direct to our speakers um, we need a microphone here please Adab, um, just thank you to all of you for being so vulnerable today and sharing your work with us and for continuing to put in the work. Um, my question was for Yasmin from Noel, um, but I want to say if you don't feel like answering it, that's okay and we'll talk after. And even if you don't want to answer then, that's fine. But thank you for taking us through the production process and the production cycle, it was, it was really important. Um, it's very clear now. Um, my question was, how does compensation work within the production cycle um, in terms of income or redistribution of the financial resources? Um, yeah, or like maybe you could tell us a bit more about uh, in whose hands the ownership of the means of the production lie or, um, yeah, I was, it was mostly from a curiosity perspective. Um, yeah, that was my question. Thank you again. Um, thank you for the question, but it's kind of, it's kind of hard to hear. Uh, it was hard for me to hear. I'm sorry. Shall I repeat one it? One more time. Yes. yes. Is this better by any chance? Maybe bring it down, because the speaker, I don't know if the speakers are just... No. <laughs> okay, we'll just talk after. It's okay. okay. Can Working you try now? now? Yeah? Okay. Um, I said uh, the production process that you walked us through in terms of the cycle and all the factors that you keep in mind was very clear. So thank you. My question was, how does compensation work within the production cycle that you uh, mentioned? in terms of the redistribution of income or financial resources? Um, and just an additional question of whose hands do the ownership of the means of this production yeah. Uh, lie in? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, okay, so we started off with, um, with the idea that every producer that we work with sets their prices. The problem is that men that we work with ask for a lot which is fine, we respect it, of course. But the women don't ask for anything. So because there's, look like with embroidery, as beautiful and powerful and, and political as it is and, and important, women are taken advantage of. They are expected to produce these pieces for, for buyers all over the world and in Palestine and they're expected to do it at the cheapest rate possible. So they're so unused to actually being valued for their work. So I remember being really shocked by the prices that they were asking. And so we actually had to, I had to have so many conversations, not just once or twice, but a few conversations with the embroiderers specifically, like you have to ask for more. You have, you, and I can't put the price because I'm not here with you, you're doing this at home, you're the one who, who's putting in the hours and you know the exhaustion of your work. So usually our, our model now is like whatever you ask, like we at least double it because it's not, we know it's not even close to what they're working. Other people that we work with are better at putting prices. Um, the men, again, the men are very good at overcharging, <laughs> which is fine. So yeah, we do a model where everyone that we work with 
sets their price according to what they do. Because again, we work with people who work from home, people who work in families, and so it, we can't come with a pricing model. So that's why our pieces kind of vary so much. And on the website, we do get the question, like, why are things so expensive? It's because we, if one day someone comes and says, okay, yesterday I took 200 shaken, today I need to take 230 because I ended up, I had to do an extra step or something. We're like, okay, great. So we, we literally immediately go and adjust the website to, to reflect that. Um, so that's the idea, that's how we do it. And then anyone who works in the studio, um, we all work with fixed salaries, if that makes sense. And thank you for the question. Do we have questions, comments from the audience? La Revuelta. Can we have the microphone? Can we have a microphone? Oh, okay. And then, and then La Revuelta. Yeah, hi, sorry, it was me. I, I thought someone else was going. Uh, this is another question for uh, Yasmin. Um, so it, it is kind of a follow-up. I would like to know if there's a way to scale production, which is a little bit, of course, given the, uh, the age range of the women who do the tafriz, it might be a little bit difficult. However, in, in a modern, in like a modernized, I don't know, production industry, we would have enough people doing the, like the nitty gritty, like, like the things that actually require labor. Uh, now, actually, I don't, want it, I don't want it to be too big of a question, so I'll stop, I'll stop there. Uh, thank you for the question. Just to make sure I got it, you're asking about being able to scale it in, in the realities. Um, it's, it's kind of complicated because as you said, it's, it's really the nitty gritty of it. Like the, the, the labor is, is done by women who are more scarce as they age um, and are more scarce in terms of being able to find women that are willing to do the work, um, especially at their age. Um, so with embroidery specifically, it is really hard to scale, I'm not gonna lie. And with weaving, like we didn't get a chance to play the weaving videos, but uh, the we, we work with two weavers only in Bel Khalil, um, and they're old. As I said, one is older and she is a cancer survivor and she still has to go into the hospital pretty often, to be honest. And the other one, Imam Salem, is she's got to be like in her 70s or 80s. And they're working so hard to teach younger women in the village, but they're not anywhere close to being able to, to take the work on. Um, so there's just not enough women doing the work. Um, and so when we, like that bag that I w was in the presentation, uh, the woven bag on the chair, we only make five of those at a time and it takes months to make. <laughs> um, so. In, when it comes to t-shirts, for example, though, that's way easier to scale. Um, so it just depends. Like some things we're able to scale and some things we're not. And I kind of like not being able to scale it. Like there's something special to know that you're one of five people that has this bag and one of 10 people that has this embroidered shirt. So I think there is kind of a special element to it. Uh, yeah, I, I think um, like when I, when I was thinking of scaling, uh, it's also the element of the, like the archival element of Tatriz. Uh, so, so in a way, scaling is, you know, having more people produce more uh, pieces. Uh, yeah. However, you know, I, I think I understand the gist. Yeah, okay, when it comes to the archival element, so the thing is, when I'm speaking about like these traditional thwab, a lot of women who have thweb today don't have thweb that actually reflect their region anymore. Like younger women. The older women do, but the younger women, like if they have a thweb in their closet, it's, it'll be kind of a mishmash of, so, of different regions and the colors are very modern colors. Like pink used to be traditionally for the Gaza region. Now everyone has a pink thweb. It doesn't matter where you're from because it's just a pretty color. So with the archiving, it's kind of hard to do now 
um, because I have to understand how to archive something that has just changed so radically and is constantly changing, if that makes sense. Uh, yes, it does. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Two questions. Beatrice and then Sara. Hi. So this question goes for Soledad. <laughs> and the question is, since you were born outside of Chile in exile, how have your artistic practices and investigation around historical memory changed your perception about your identity regarding your country? Yeah, so we were talking about this because I feel like there's very, there is something very special about that word being born in exile because you kind of are born in this state of in-betweenness or, and so I was saying how sometimes I feel more at home with songs. Like I hear a song from people that were in the exile, why they made that, and that feels very home. You know, like Lo Jaiva or Victor Jara, Violeta Parra, like, and so, but at the same time, I do have indigenous lineage, you know? And when I went to Nel Tume, um, just seeing these trees that are 500 years old, they're older than Chile itself, it's like, I understand, you know? And also I lived in Chile from 2000, no, from 1991 until 2007. So I, until I was 21, I thought I was Chilena and I was gonna never leave, you know? But then because of personal reasons, I had to leave. But it's really nice to see Chile as a Chilena and Chile outside. And I think that's why it's so important for me to go to these institutions that have these archives that explain that our oppression was not only from this dictatorship inside of our country, but it was a global thing, you know? It's like the students from the University of Chicago taught by Milton Friedman wrote the, the, this book called El Ladrillo. And that book was installed by the Junta and those were the principles of neoliberalism that now make it so that all of our natural resources are um, privatized. And so that my people keep dying because not now of a dictatorship, but because of lung cancer, um, because of drought, because of the river I used to go to is dry because people in the north eat avocados suddenly, you know? Or the reason why the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan, I live in Ontario, are able to own the water rights of all of, when, of three com major companies in Chile is this globalized look that when you're inside of Chile, you don't see, but when you get the opportunity of just like boo, 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 boo. just like a painting right when you're in or like a weaving a weaving has a macro and then you go far 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 oh wait you know like that was a face you know like you get to see the bigger picture so yeah but I'm very Chilena y'all know I I talk very weird and all that you know yeah <laughs> Thank you very much. It was uh, really compelling and beautiful. Um, I, it's not a precise question. It's maybe more of a reflection I wanted to ask you maybe to feedback on, um, which is much very much related with uh, uh, every one of yours intergenerational uh, poetics. 
Uh, and I think that we need so much of that. And that made me think how much the, nar the mainstream narrative around uh, climate crisis often try to uh, um, cast blame on the previous generations and how much that disrupt also the relations within, within families. Uh, so it's not a very well formalized question, but it's rather if you could share this, uh, uh, I mean, your take on how important it is for you uh, to work in between generations. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think for us, d Somali nomadic culture hasn't changed in 10,000 years. And then suddenly you have a disruption. And um, it's a hard life. I mean, Somali people are very poor, you know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, fourth, I think it might be the second or third poorest country in the world. Um, uh, but despite that, it has a really rich um, history in nomadism, and we have a wonderful relationship to the camel. The camel features a lot in our work because um, the camel is the way Somali people have sustained their lives. We have the largest camel herd in the world. So I, I think that people don't under, you know, there's a really, to survive out in these semi-arid landscapes, you need the camel. But besides that camel and that relationship, with that, there's knowledge. So you, you need the knowledge from these people that have lived on that land because the land seems barren, but actually they will know that in this area you can dig up bulbs that are edible, you know, or um, you can, if you're in very bad drought, uh, which again, it's been six years of no rain, we've got the worst climate, you know, there are four million people displaced because of climate a few years, you know, I don't know when it was, 2000 and, God, five years ago, 250,000 children died because of famine. It's not report, you know, outside of Somalia, really, people don't talk about it. They talk about climate change as if it's a catastrophe that's happening, that is ha gonna happen at some point to them. But actually, it's been happening to Somali people for years. They've been living with drought, they've been living with climate. And so the reason why we work with our elders so much is the memory and the songs that they have. And that, that age group, when they die, there's a lot of knowledge that will be lost. There's smaller and smaller nomadic communities able to survive. And um, the weaving songs and the patterns and the, that kind of way of building, and it's the women that build the agal. So, you know, the house is built by women. The weaving is done by women. So um, w for us, we, we're seeing our engagement is to try and help preserve some of that. Um, it's still very difficult, you know, because of displacement and the, the ongoing situation with um, drought there. But so part of the reason we're trying to work with our ancestors and highlight these old weaving songs and weaving practices is to say there is still a living culture here that's worth, that's worth saving. So you, you've got this whole discussion around loss and damage. You know, I know, it was it the UAE that hosted uh, COP? I don't know where it was hosted. Anyway, I, I think recently it was hosted here. Um, and it was the first time that I think there has been um, a sort of commitment to loss and damage. But if you look at what's happening in Palestine, uh, I, I, it doesn't give me faith for uh, the West's approach to climate. You know, the, the bombs that have been dropped in Palestine are the equivalent of 20 countries' energy use in a year. So I, I don't believe there is the, the, it, 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 the world is collapsing around us and there is a fight over resources and it is being played out in Palestine, it's being played out in Sudan, it's being played out in, in the Congo. Um, but equally, we can't, we have to keep some of the magic and the love and alive and, and you know, 
through weaving and songs, you, you have to keep trying, keep fighting for that culture that's kind of going to be extinct through these actions. So that's why it's important to work with our elders. Uh, we had one question here, Sara. First of all, thank you so much for such profound narratives from each and every one of you. Um, I have a question for Maria. It starts off with a reflection and then a question. Um, just over a year ago, just over a year ago, I visited the Oros Islands on Lake Titicaca in, in Peru. And um, we saw these beautiful, beautiful textiles that gave such profound stories of the connection between um, people and, um, and nature. And at the time, I found that these islands were so disconnected and how can everybody else and how, you know, how can we reach these stories globally and these textiles? Because it was such a beautiful craft and such beautiful stories. And then I was surprised to hear that the, um, the art of textiles and crafts have been omitted from the curricula um, in Peru. So I saw it as a challenge before, and now I see it as a, as, a, as a much bigger challenge. Do you see that this challenge is growing to be able to teach and transcend this craft? Or do you think that it, there is a lot of hope, let's say, or hope is a weak word, um, there's, you know, there's the possibility of overcoming that challenge quite soon? Hello, thank you for your question. Mm, yeah, it's a quite challenge uh, for, for our, our countries, mostly for Peru, because Peru was the, the place where colonization impacted the most. For example, in Bolivia, uh, they have already been working in the schools with the weaving language and taking it into consideration as a language as itself, as we have been saying it throughout our presentations. There, as I said, there, has, there are a lot of uh, thinkers and creators as uh, Elvira Espejo from Bolivia, uh, Silvia Rivera Cusicanqui. But in Peru, uh, this uh, field of weaving, it's still not included, and I don't think it's going to a positive direction yet. Because, for example, in, in the school where, where I studied painting in Lima, it's one of the most renowned schools in Peru, the Pontificia Universidad Católica. They have inserted, um, they are like skipping many historical layers. And for example, they inserted suddenly a lot of uh, floor looms, which have European heritage, because they were uh, brought by, by Europe uh, with the colonization. And suddenly they have there are classes uh, within the fashion department that are uh, including the, 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 the floor loom as a, a medium, as a tool, right? But we are not being taught our history uh, of weaving in, in, since its origins. Like the backstrap loom, it's uh, still omitted because if you don't go uh, directly to the Andes to search for that uh, knowledge, so for those knowledges directly from its, root, its roots, then you won't find it anywhere. So I think the, in the education, the Peruvian edu education, um, specifically talking about art schools, there is a miscomprehension of, of weaving still, still present. Still it's a void and the most important is to focus on creating uh, the first uh, or integrating either integrating the medium as a weaving in it, in it in it of itself within art schools or creating a a school of weaving in Peru the first school of weaving that I, I think I would dream that it would be in the Andes and not in the capital in Lima I hope I, I re respond to your question I think we're going to close the session and we can take questions in the breakout room. All right, thank you everyone.
Thank you to our speakers. We'll now invite our panelists, moderator, and audience members to join us in the breakout room for a 30-minute breakout session. Our next session will be uh, will start at 12:35 p.m. instead of the scheduled time. See you. <laughs>